Good afternoon. The, the overarching uh, theme in this afternoon's presentation is about the importance of integrating IT and facility operations. Some of the worst cases uh, resulting from disconnects that we've seen have been going into data centers in an emergency design capacity uh, where they had a dozen new IT racks sitting in the hallway with no place to install them in the data center. And two weeks ago, I was at a data center which was struggling with stability in their operation because they are five years into operation and still only loaded to about 10% of their design capacity. And these are both issues that have arisen out of IT operating in a silo and facility operating in a silo without coordinative, coordinated planning and road mapping. Some of the best cases that I've seen uh, in the work that I've done have been clients where even just adding a single server in the data center involves a team of IT and facilities that identify the best place in the data center to put that new device uh, based on cooling, based on power availability, based on network availability, based, and based on minimizing the work needed to install it there. And another client who, after starting off in a siloed capacity and then getting more integrated, uh, was really surprised to learn that with the incremental improvements in availability that came from large additions of additional uh, in physical infrastructure in a data center, that it was actually higher availability and a lower cost for them to build an entire additional data center with both data centers at a slightly lower level of redundancy and providing redundancy at the application level so that if there was a problem at one site, it could seamlessly fail over to another. And through this, what we are seeing is that the closest level to the physical work that the two silos can come together in the management chain, the better they're coordinated. Uh, some of the best cases we've seen of this have been individual data center managers that are responsible for both IT and network. And at the other opposite end of the spectrum, we have seen facilities roll up through real estate and <clears throat> IT organizations roll up through their CTO to a point where they don't actually come together in the management chain until either the CFO or sometimes even the CEO. The goals of effective operation are going to be maximum availability. Everybody wants to be 100% running 100% of the time, uh, lowest cost, free is best, and maximum capacity because everyone would love to arbitrarily have so much capacity that they can do anything they want in their data center without worrying about it. These things are obviously trade-offs. Uh, more availability is going to drive more cost. More capacity is going to drive more cost. Cutting costs can impact either capacity or availability or both. And we're going to talk about some of the places where these are direct trade-offs and some of these places where synergies can be recognized to, for the most benefit and the most effective utilization of the organization's resources. Going through this, I want to talk about the terminology for this. Uh, capacity, uh, looking at this from a facility standpoint, is really primarily focused on making sure that there is adequate power and cooling for the planned loads. And then availability is looking at what percent of the time out of continuously running that the equipment is has full power, full cooling, and is operating as expected. And also that there are two impacts to this. There is planned downtime. If you plan an outage for, say, 24 hours from Saturday night through Sunday night, that reduces the available time, but it's not a hit on reliability because it's expected, it's planned. And then there are unplanned outages, and those are disruptive, they impact business operations, they cost money, 
and it's to but the impact is varying and to different extents for different types of organizations so it needs to be reviewed so that the right size solution can be obtained uh, one example is that for say an online retailer they may be able to have a small localized outage and have the time from a uh, customer hits buy now slow down from a quarter of a second to three quarters of a second and they don't care but they need to have their website online 24 hours a day so that they don't miss a sale whereas a financial trading desk may need to have absolute as close as they can get to zero possibility of ever having interruption during trading hours but they may have no problem shutting down for 24 hours on the weekend even once a quarter and all of these things drive the budget and the decisions that are made how to use resources effectively so this slide talks about the obvious trade-offs where between availability and cost uh, redundancy is one of the places that drives availability and cost uh, for example you could look at a 2n plus 1 redundancy in a UPS system where you have a total load that could be supported by one UPS but you have an extra one in the system uh, so that one can fail and have another identical system and there's a lot of money into the capital cost and there's additional energy consumption but it provides the greatest assurance that you can have a component failure you can have a system failure and there will be no interruption in compute and the same extends to whether it's chillers or whether it's cooling units and then there are cost savings initiatives that can come at expense of availability uh, one example would be running a UPS in a high efficiency mode where it's normally completely on bypass letting utility power go through but it can very quickly switch to bypass to UPS operation if there's a blip in the utility that can save a lot of energy and have a very small reduction in availability because it's a very low probability that the UPS could have a problem switching from bypass to its inverter whereas that you know that wouldn't happen if it was already on the inverter and these are the things where IT and facilities need to come together and look at how much money can we save and is that an acceptable risk for our organization but the thing I wanted to bring to attention here is it's not always a trade-off sometimes there are things that you can do that it can improve both uh, the first one is I want to talk about is improving airflow the thing that all of your IT equipment most wants is an acceptable temperature with a very little fluctuation so hot spots are a problem and changing temperatures are a problem <clears throat> there <clears throat> anything that you can do to improve the air getting from your cooling unit to through your devices and back to the cooling unit without taking any detours is going to get the warmest air back to the cooling unit it's going to have the best efficiency for reduced operating cost and it's going to provide the most reliable operation for the equipment because it's getting the conditioned air exactly as it's intended and if the hot air is getting directly back to the cooling unit it's not going into the intake to another IT device and having it run on air that's not conditioned the way it was intended uh, one of the most low-hanging fruit uh, all all bent pretty much all benefit approach is eliminating congested cabling removing abandoned cables that aren't currently in use and getting them routed and this has multiple benefits it improves the airflow what improving the airflow reduces the energy consumption but it also drastically reduces the odds of uh, either he human error or damage problems when changing cabling because if you if you don't have abandoned cables and the cables are labeled and they're routed neatly 
then when you go to install a cable or remove a cable, there's a much better chance that you're going to be working on the right one, not affecting one adjacent to it, and not introducing errors through operation. Uh, the other area where we can see synergistic benefits is in either adding or transitioning to predictive maintenance from preventative maintenance so that you can identify problems early, correct them before failure, and avoid replacing perfectly good parts. Uh, the picture on the right is an example of identifying problems early. The picture on the right is equipment which is clearly full of dirt, uh, prone to problems, prone to resulting in unplanned downtime. Where, And if you're on a clock-based approach and something happens that lets it get to that condition in six months and the maintenance schedule says you need to clean that once a year, you have a six-month period where you're a lot more likely to have a failure. And on the flip side, it may take five years to get there and then you're wasting effort doing something just because the schedule calls for it. Predictive maintenance is much more based on looking at actual condition, actual performance, and taking the appropriate actions based on the actual conditions. Documentation, both of configuration and operating procedures, is absolutely key to getting consistent, repeatable performance in the data center. Uh, Starting with configuration, if you do not have accurate as-built documentation, there is a much greater chance of either someone in your facility or an outside vendor making an error in either maintenance or operation because they build plans based on the documentation, and if the documentation does not make the equipment, does not match the equipment, uh, they're much more likely to induce human error, the causing an outage. This rolls into operating procedures and that ties into very often when documentation is incomplete, this is managed, this is mitigated by keeping the same staff, having a lot of institutional knowledge, having people who have everything in their head. Uh, but the two risks that fall out of that, uh, one is that anyone can have a bad day, or you can have something happen at two o'clock in the morning and you roust someone out of bed to race over to the data center and try to solve the problems. And if there's nothing to reference and everything is in their head and they're still half asleep, they're a lot more likely to make an error. And the other problem that we're continuing to see is as the workforce becomes more transient and as we have an older workforce that are starting to come into retirements, we have a lot of customers who have people who are completely confident running the data center, but they've been doing it for, you know, as since the day the data center opened. They have the staff they had from day one, they've seen every change that happened through the life of the facility, but they're becoming eligible for retirement. And as they bring in new people who are completely trained in the equipment, completely trained in data centers, but still aren't familiar with that particular facility, they need to have documentation to refer back to to fill in all the gaps that have previously been covered just by living in people's brains that are, you know, whether they hit the lottery, whether they retire, uh, whether they get sick, whether they go on vacation, are not always there to patch those gaps in documented knowledge. And lastly, maintenance plans. In addition to making sure that everything gets done in a timely manner so that everything stays operating correctly, they are also key for maintaining warranty coverage. Because usually if something fails in warranty, there are usually maintenance requirements in the contracts that you need to be able to document and demonstrate that you've satisfied and maintained in order to have your warranty honored on that equipment.
I wanted to drill down a little bit deeper on optimizing air management. <clears throat> the first one, which is low hanging fruit, is blanking panels in equipment. And these are just plastic panels that snap into where servers could go, where servers are not installed. And what that does is it stops air from the discharge of the equipment being able to go through those unused spaces in the rack and get pulled by the server fans back to the front of the rack and put unconditioned air back into the equipment, driving hot spots and also driving inefficiencies in the cooling system. Uh, Cable mining is another great example. I, in the previous picture, I had shown where cables were cascading down the back of racks, stopping the air from making it from the back of the server out of the back of the rack. Uh, what we find even more often is air dams and floors. Like in the second picture, there are so many cables installed that the air is unable to effectively come up from the underfloor plenum through the perforated tiles to cool the equipment. And that usually ends up driving a lot of static loss. It ends up resulting in needing to run additional cooling units just for the fans uh, beyond what's needed for the cooling. And because you just can't get the air where it's needed in some places, it usually involves overcooling the air and distributing the air at a colder temperature than what would otherwise be needed. Uh, just so that by the time it finally makes it to the equipment, it's still an acceptable temperature for operation. Uh, the third picture shows a chimney extension on a craw unit. Uh, these are often used in two different ways. In the picture shown, it goes all the way up to the ceiling, which allows the space above the ceiling to be used as a hot air return plenum. Uh, perforated tiles are installed over the hot aisles to let the hot, hot air from the racks make it out of the room up into a segregated space above the finished ceiling and provide a direct path for hot air back to the cooling units. Uh, but in space places where that's not available, uh, we have also seen drastic improvements from having extensions like that go up to just below the ceiling so that the hot air coming out of the racks is able to rise up and form a layer just below the ceiling, which is above the racks. It lets the cooling units draw the warmest air in the room from right near the ceiling to run with higher efficiency. And it stops that hot, hot layer of air from coming all the way down to the level of the racks and having hot air enter the top five or six use space in the racks, overheating the servers that are installed highest in the racks. Uh, the ultimate end state is in the bottom picture with hot and cold aisle containment. Uh, in the example shown, this is hot aisle containment. Uh, the space around the racks is completely blocked in so that all the air coming out of the servers has to go back into a plenum that goes back to the cooling units. The cooling units flood the room with cold air so that all of the air going into the servers uh, is conditioned. Uh, this is usually only needed in higher density applications, although the trends in industry are that as the overall density comes up, more and more implementations are benefiting from this. Uh, the trade-off that needs to be stay at the front of mind is that <clears throat> the blanking panels become much more important uh, because there is less, the air is usually moving at lower velocities and it becomes even easier for the server fans to pull hot air from the back of the rack to the front and short circumvent the intended cooling system if the blanks are not kept sealed in the containment system. After we come through all of this, the ultimate question is all, the, that always comes is, okay, we put money into improving our cable management. We put money into improving our airflow management. What, did, what was the benefit? And at the end of the day, you cannot you can't continue to improve what you can't measure. You need to be able to quantify your gains in order to identify whether or not you've met your goal, 
whether or not you've used your money effectively and whether or not you should continue on with a path. The most, a lot of data centers, I would say most data centers have some form of building management system, building automation system, electrical power monitoring system, industrial control system that gathers the information from most of the key infrastructure. Sometimes this is sufficient, sometimes it doesn't provide enough detail. We have a new trend moving towards data center information management systems that uh, communicate with more devices and it provides more granularity in the reporting, uh, but it's still ultimately incumbent on the implementation to make sure that there are sensors in the required places and that the reporting screens aggregate those numbers in the proper way to get meaningful information. The other source of information that can come into helping measure these things are utility, utility meters uh, that the power company might use to generate your bill, uh, your gas metering, uh, your diesel consumption if you're in, <coughs> if you're having significant on-site generation. And then also, there is billing metering in a lot of data centers that can also help identify how the power is being used and where it's going. Whether it's a co-location facility that is measuring their customers' utilization to bill them, or an enterprise data center which has metering so that they can bill their different business units for their how much of the data center they use. A lot of times this information can also be used uh, for LEED, whether it's new construction and a LEED certification, or whether it's a operations, you know, continuing operations LEED certificate that your organization's looking for. Uh, it may be that you're going for Energy Star documentation. It may be that you need, that your industry, and this is particularly common in the public sector, requires validation that they're meeting power utilization targets. Power utilization is really just an, um, ratio that defines how much power the whole data center uses versus how much is going just to support the IT. Uh, so it comes out as a very simple ratio of the power coming into the building versus the power that's being consumed by the servers and other information technology equipment. Once all this information has been gathered, it can also be trended and rolled into the predictive maintenance. Uh, because if you know what your computing load is, you can look at how your energy consumption tracks to that. And increased energy consumption with a constant load or growth out of proportion to the IT growth can be indications of equipment that's not operating properly. It can be indicative of a failing insulation system that's making the cooling system try to cool the out the whole outside world also. And measuring the IT power utilization against the IT needs can also help with identifying whether or not the IT hardware is being used effectively. PUE is just an indication of how effective the cooling, lighting, and admin systems are against what the IT is doing. But it doesn't really tell the whole story about how well the IT is being used. As Trish mentioned in the introduction, several industry studies are showing that it is typical to see 15 to 40 percent of servers in a data center just sitting idle, unused, uh, because the application's gone away or it's been migrated to new equipment people haven't kept track of what was being used where, and these servers are just sitting, serving no useful purpose, <coughs> consuming electricity and generating heat to be removed. And one of the things that can be observed out of the trending is, for example, if a new deployment comes in and new, new, new hardware is installed, and the new hardware is at least as efficient, if not more, if there are no new applications added and there's no IT demand addition, but the power utilization comes up, that is a red flag 
that the equipment that was replaced was probably either not at all decommissioned or not thoroughly decommissioned, and that there are servers sitting on the floor that need to be identified, verified that they're not producing productive outcomes, and decommissioned so that they stop wasting energy. Predictive maintenance is another item that I wanted to touch on. I think everyone on the call is going to be familiar with preventative maintenance. Uh, you have a schedule, there's things you do monthly, there's things you do quarterly, there's things you do once a year, and it may be cleaning, it may be cleaning, it may be changing the oil in the engine, it may be changing an air filter, but it is purely based on what's typical or a mean time before failure or manufacturer's guess at how the equipment is going to work. Where predictive maintenance goes and looks at actual performance. It is the review of that we just talked about with the power consumption. It is going in and taking measurements and making sure that all of the sensors are still calibrated accurately so that the equipment that's based on those operations, based on those sensors, is operating based on good input. Uh, it can include doing infrared scans that, without touching anything, identify hot spots. It's done on electrical equipment to look for bad connections and degraded components that are beginning to overheat and maybe working okay today but show that they require maintenance or tightening a connection or replacement of a device before there's a problem. It is also used extensively on mechanical equipment. Uh, lots of rotating equipment has bearings that <clears throat> run hotter when there's more friction. And this is why it's usually not a pass-fail process, but it is going in periodically, whether it's annually or quarterly or every two years and trending those over time so that however it normally operates in that situation, there is a trend to watch where if it starts to be 15 degrees warmer than it was every year for the last three years, it may still be running perfectly acceptably, but it's an indication that it's starting to wear out and should be replaced before it gets bad. Uh, vibration monitoring is also used to look for rotating equipment that has uh, bearings or shafts or other things that are starting to not run true and are er very early indications of an impending failure that might still be a year or two away, but it can be watched, tracked, and the equipment can be replaced before it causes a problem rather than going on a schedule that is probably equally likely to replace something that's perfectly fine or not scheduled to replace something until after it's failed. And while those, and while the numbers are based on averages and maybe 95% of the time it's gonna replace it at exactly the right time, it's still leaving the potential for wasteful replacement and failure to replace before it causes a problem. Uh, infrared scanning is also frequently used on roof systems because <clears throat> if water gets into the roof, the roof will cool off at a differential rate. Uh, so it's possible to go up with a temperature sensing camera at a either at sunrise or at sunset when there's a rapid change in temperature of the roof. A roof that's in good condition will change temperature evenly. Wet spots under a membrane will have the thermal mass of the water and change more slowly and stand out like a sore thumb. So Trish, I want to hand it back to you for a wrap up. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Ian. Very, very good um, discussions going on and um, hopefully we'll get good discussions and questions at the end. But I did want to wrap up on a few things because I have a few hot buttons here based on travels and talkings to CIOs, facilities, executives and the like. And the top one, uh, I have a good colleague, and he and I, when we visit clients, we usually just walk in the room, and we know when we sit down at the table with people whether some of their um, improvements are going to be focused on IT or facilities and how successful that's going to be based on who's sitting at the table. 
And what I mean by that, and, and I'll just use a simple example, you got a coin, you got heads or tails. In our industry, you've got a coin, you got facilities and, and IT, and the two need to be going hand in hand together to effectively integrate, look at the strategic planning, maximize the use of the resources that are in there. As Ian talked about earlier in the in the presentation, if you look at the um, the, the, the pyramids below or the triangles below, uh, the, the more the people are sitting at the table of, of facilities and IT together, the less um, you're going to have of inadequate um, infrastructure or underutilized infrastructure. And we see both. And, and it is so important that we see the facilities that are are investing in making continuous improvements to, to improve their availability, their capacity, uh, and stay within their budgets. They, If they're not sitting at the table together and they're not doing strategic plans together, a lot of time they're wasting money. And that's one thing in this industry you do not want to do. So one of the things that I, uh, and, I and I'm glad we let off with this because I think it is critical um, to the success as we move forward in this ever pace, fast changing paced uh, environment that, that we're looking with. Common reporting structures help ensure common communication and coordination of common goals. And I, I think that that is a very uh, key point. And then we went on to discuss the capacity with the definitions, the maximum availability, and the budgets. But what's important here is as those two groups are really combining themselves, and Ian spoke about this, they need to define for their organization based on their designs, based on their um, capabilities, based on what the roadmap looks like for the future, for, for what their servers and, and what they're going to need for load. What is the capacity? What's the availability? And then what budget constraints are they going to be working with them? So again, sitting at the table, working together, improving availability can save cost. And one of the things, um, a little bit, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but um, I, I, again, Ian focused on this with um, areas that you can take both on the, on the IT floor as well as uh, in the facilities areas where we can, you can, can daily can um, start improving costs. Documentation is key. I don't need to, to say any more about that. I think Ian hit on that. Documentation, documentation for repeatability so you can understand when you go in your data center where some of the issues could be in just the way you operate your data center and and, and the performance is critical. The airflow, as he talked about it, for to, to optimize and improve efficiency and performance. And the one thing, he uh, measuring the energy use in the data center and documenting the performance and evaluating that. You know, one of the things that we find that clients want us to do is we go in there and we document and we look at, at um, where there are opportunities for improvements. And then in, in by through the process of implementing those, it gives them the u utility incentives um, we, we, we are registered with several of the firms for the, so that we will be able, when we make these um, suggestions, you know, that the firms, when they implement them, can get the utility incentives. And again, that is, that is truly getting back to, you know, minimizing your cost and maximizing your efficiencies in other areas, as well as what he talked about with um, predictive maintenance. We found that. In fact, I found that in my past life um, it is much more efficient than just focused on the um, preventative maintenance too. So I hope you guys have, have, you know, got a little bit. I don't think a whole lot is rocket science that we're talking about today, but the, I think the important thing is the two teams coming together, common goals, common focus, and then driving succinctly you know, the improvements that affect both the IT and the facility. So they're in a line like the pyramid is at the at the bottom. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to David. I think he's got some questions. He wants to drive the questions and discussion section. So David, I'm going to move it over to you. Thank you, Trish. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, such a great presentation.